At just 19, Palmer Kipola received a life-altering diagnosis, a prognosis so dire, her doctors thought she may never walk again. She had taken my parents aside and told them to prepare for my life in a wheelchair because that's where I was headed. Palmer has multiple sclerosis, an incurable but treatable autoimmune disease where your body attacks its own nerves. So what kind of symptoms were you having? This feeling of constriction, like rubber bands around my torso, zapping jolts down my spine every time I bent my neck forward. For decades, Palmer struggled. On top of that, she had stomach issues that no one was able to help her with until she met with a functional medicine nutritionist who tested and discovered Palmer's gluten and dairy sensitivities. We did some gut healing, took out the bad stuff. The results were dramatic and swift. Within a week, I stopped having that tummy trouble after eating. And within one month, I stopped having MS symptoms. Functional medicine shifts the focus away from just treating symptoms and aims to understand why those symptoms are occurring in the first place. According to the Institute for Functional Medicine, its popularity is surging. Last year, 276 clinicians became certified as functional medicine practitioners. That number expected to nearly triple in 2022. I like to define functional medicine as investigative medicine. It's really going deeper into the root causes of chronic conditions. Dr. Cynthia Lee, a one-time skeptic, now specializes in functional medicine along with being an internist. She believes it's filling a critical void where traditional medicine falls short. A lot of patients have symptoms like fatigue, or dizziness, they will go to their primary care doctor and the doctor will, will order some screening labs and everything comes back normal. What additional tests will a functional medicine specialist run that a primary care physician might not? Testing might include um, nutrient deficiencies. Testing, you know, doing a series of stool tests to make sure there are no hidden uh, bacteria or parasites. Many treatments come back to the basics of what every doctor thinks is crucial for health. Eating right, exercising regularly, and managing stress. Tenets Dr. Lee has adopted to manage her own health struggles. I developed an autoimmune thyroid condition after my daughter was born. So it really forced me to begin to think about uh, healing um, and medicine in a different way. Today, you'll find Dr. Lee following a plant-based diet walking every day and practicing qigong. Functional medicine takes a lot of personal effort and commitment. So it is not just um, taking a pill. But for patients like Palmer, seeing a functional doctor has been life changing. So is this a, is this a new Palmer? Is this a different Palmer? <laughs> this is a new me. I have more energy. I'm stronger, fitter than I was. It's changed my life, not just my health. I mean, I, I have to say that I'm on a prevention path now. It's given me not just my health back, but my life back. So to be clear, if someone's calling themselves a functional medicine doctor or physician, they've gone through traditional medical school training, much like I have, but they may also choose to get certified in functional medicine from an organization like the Institute for Functional Medicine. Hmm. Now, currently visits and tests aren't typically covered by insurance, but that could change in the near future. And yes, Craig, I am a fun guy. <laughs> <laughs> right. hey, hey, Dr. John, I'm just, I'm just curious. Are, are these doctors located all over? Are they easy to find? They're, they are located all over, and numbers have dramatically increased even over the last year, and they're expected to increase even more. So nice. they're not difficult difficult to find. Typically, you can go in the, you know online and find them, and uh, they're fantastic. Dr. Dr. Wow. John Torres, the all-around fun guy. That's right. <laughs> don't, don't, call don't call him a truffle. <laughs> don't call him a truffle. <laughs> oh, I don't uh, get it. Oh, oh, I got it. 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 I feel like you didn't yeah, miss yeah. much. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much everyone for watching. We've got an epic lineup tonight of speakers. We've got an awesome panel here. Amazing group of functional doctors, technology activists uh, for here for Elite Forward in Medicine. You know, our goal is to make it easy for practitioners to learn in community. This ecosystem that is being set up by the meetup groups, we believe will be the future ecosystem of this evolved primary care network, and it all revolves around you. Welcome to the Functional Forum. Thanks for joining us in the charge to accelerate the evolution of medicine. Please welcome your host, James Maskell.
Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Functional Forum. This is the 99th episode of the show. Couldn't be more excited. We've got an incredible uh, lineup of speakers tonight. We've got a topic that I know is near and dear to so many people's hearts in this uh, in this community. We're going to be talking about biotoxin illness and endotoxemia. Um, definitely a hot topic. And we've got the right guests here uh, to share what's working in functional medicine and um, how you as a practitioner can get better outcomes or be part of a community that really helps people with this uh, these kinds of issues. Um, we are live, so if you want to ask questions, you can go onto Twitter, you can go to hashtag functional forum. Uh, we'll have some time for questions all the way through. Um, super excited to have uh, tonight Dr. Jeffrey Bland, the godfather of functional medicine. We've got D Dr. Jill Carnahan, uh, one of the leading educators and physicians in this biotoxin illness space. And then we've got Dr. Jill Krista as well, um, who is uh, a leading educator and uh, wrote the book Breaking the Mold and uh, super excited to have them all here for today. Now, this originally was going to be a little of a bit of a preview for this uh, personalized lifestyle medicine conference, May 13 to 14 um, in Chicago. Sadly, or not sadly, but excitingly, it's completely sold out. You know, this is obviously a hot topic, and I think people are ready to come together back into community, which is really exciting. Um, so, you know, I'll be there with the cameras uh, for that event, and we hope to uh, make it easy for those of you who can't be there. Um, uh, I understand there might be some, some live streaming options coming, because I think this is the earliest that this conference has ever been sold out. So uh, exciting times on that. And then also exciting, this is the 99th episode. Next month, May the 2nd, is the 100th episode of the Functional Forum. Uh, when we started back in, in February uh, 2014, didn't really know what we were getting into. But over the last eight years, um, you know, what we're going to do on this show is really showcase sort of where we came from, which, you know, Dr. Jeffrey Glad was a critical uh, person in my education and really helping us understand the role of the micro practice and how we can use a low overhead model to get more doctors in. Dr. Saxena is obviously such a leader when it comes to, you know, operationalizing functional medicine, and she's a great clinician too. And then Dr. Angela LaSalle is the current head of integrative and functional medicine at Parkview Hospital. And so, you know, we're going to be sort of going to the past of you know, what we've been able to achieve and then looking to the future for the next 100 and saying, you know, what will it take for large scale adoption of functional medicine inside the system um, so that it's affordable and uh, accessible to all? Not much going on next time, but we will discover that <laughs> together. So I'm really excited for that. And speaking of communities, the, the Functional Forum Communities Project is taking off. I know there's a bunch of communities tomorrow night. My meeting in Folsom, California is happening that I go to. Um, there's also meetings in Austin, Texas. We've got new groups starting in New York, Philadelphia, Salt Lake City, um, you know, many different areas popping up, uh, leaders stepping up to, to build community in those local areas. And uh, super excited, even Dubai had a meeting just the other day. Uh, they sent us a picture and it looked like a jolly old time. All right, so we're going to be uh, talking about uh, functional, uh, the functional forum tonight and functional medicine. Thanks so much to all of our sponsors. We'll get to that shortly here in a minute. But let's bring on the panel. So Dr. Bland, Dr. Krista, and uh, and uh, Dr. Carnahan are all here. Great to be here, Dr. Bland. And before we get into it, that commercial, that that segment, shall I say? I mean, how long have you been waiting to see that on uh, national morning television? Well, James. Uh, before I respond to that, let me just respond to your fantastic intro and your history of this 99th edition going on to your 100th centenary edition. Uh, your contribution to this field have been, has been tremendous. And I want to just uh, acknowledge that and honor it because it takes individuals to build a community and individuals that have focus, purpose, uh, staying power, uh, have to have courage, you have to overcome criticism. I can go on and on and on, having had a few years of myself of experience in this field. And I think your contributions to annealing this as a movement is uh, to be really uh, shouted out from the, from the uh, housetop. So I just want to thank you. And I think this, uh, uh, this, this two uh, other opinion leaders that I've had the privilege today to, to speak with, uh, both Jill's, this is Jill squared. It's actually probably Jill to the fifth power. 
Uh, these are two very powerful female members of our community. And, and it just represents the kind of uh, quality and, and uh, the tenor of where this field is going to, to see the skill and the, and the excellence that uh, uh, both uh, Jill Christa and, and Jill Carnahan represent. So it's a privilege to be part of this. Now, with your question, you know, let me get to the, the key here. That's a long-winded windup. Um, when I saw that program in NBC, uh, obviously I was aware of it being filmed and was, uh, as was I think anybody behind the scenes concerned about how things would be edited and what would end up on the cutting room floor and what would ultimately be projected to the public because you don't have any control obviously over the editing process. And you never know exactly what the hidden agendas might be in, in communications. So I went with bated breath uh, to watch this program. And I, I had a little bit of hypoxia probably as it, as it came on, but I was overwhelmingly proud of the two representatives uh, that they chose to interview and how they presented themselves and their, their relationship to this, this model that we started some 30 years ago to uh, see if it had any stickiness. And then of, co of course, uh, Dr. Torres, um, I couldn't have found a better ambassador a uh, remarkable personality, very authentic, a deep experience, um, critical thinker, um, not accepting everything uh, probably that comes across his plate, but his uh, advocacy for what we're trying to do in functional medicine uh, was truly remarkable. And I think it is reflective of the fact that this discipline is starting to mature. Now on the other side of the coin, because uh, there's always two sides of every street, uh, we've got some forces that we have to deal with that are um, trying to pull apart some of the fabric of this systems biology approach to healthcare, trying to find uh, ways of either degrading it or denigrating it or criticizing it. And uh, some of that force even comes within our own ranks in which people have, uh, I think, started to use some of the concepts of functional medicine to their own advantage uh, without kind of a circumspect view of the whole. And so I think these are important critical times in our development uh, of the growth and, and uh, scalability of this model. It's a model in need. And I think you're doing such a great job in getting the message out. But we all have a responsibility to uh, be stewards as we move forward with this model to, to make it straight as, as it can be and to uh, be documented and to be properly supported. And I, I'm very confident when I have see, I see people like the two gels as our representatives that, that we will find that correct path going forward. Absolutely. Yeah, well said. And I guess I guess before we jump into to, to the clinical side of things, you know, the last time you were on here last July, you said something which is that functional medicine is not a set of therapies. It's a way of thinking. And I think Dr. Lee actually kind of you know talked about that in that video. So let's just take this to biotoxin illness, you know, because you hear people say as well, well, functional medicine is good for mold, right? So what is it about what you, if you put those two things together, why is the functional medicine approach, what is the thinking process for it? And why does it end up being good for this kind of condition? Well, obviously I'm gonna to defer to the experts uh, who are my two colleagues on this, uh, this panel, but, but I want, I'll give a kind of a frame uh, of reference for this. One of the things that uh, was asked of Dr. Torres uh, from the, uh, the other uh, announcers in the NBC program was what about testing and does it get covered by insurance? And I think that there's this, this view somehow that functional medicine is a, is a kind of a technology that you plug in into an artificial intelligence equation and it tells you exactly what tests to, to do and exactly how, you know, what kind of therapies to come out. It's all kind of compartmentals and and it's uh, routinized to, to the fact that it looks very um, therapeutically structured, like you would a DRG, a diagnostic related group, or something that comes out of pathophysiology. I want to, uh, to say that that's actually not what functional medicine is. And I think you, you, you said it very nicely in your introduction, James, and that is it's a way of actually engaging the patient in a process of self-inspection and an interrogative to try to trace through how they got to the place that they are in their lives of not feeling well and trying to find a way to understand the ideology of that from a timeline and a series of experiences that relates the genes to their life, to their environment, to their stresses, to their diet and, and, and so forth. Therefore, 
this doesn't start off with testing. I mean, you know, a lot of people think, oh, you just throw a whole pile of different tests at a person and you'll get the answer. That's really not the, the answer. The answer is skillful, intelligent listening and knowing how to write, ask the right questions, the questions that relate to upstream problems that create downstream concerns. And that's a different way of thinking about medicine than driving just to a diagnosis. Driving to a diagnosis is kind of the way that I was trained and, and more most traditionally trained health practitioners are trained. That it's all the, prima, the, the primacy is at the diagnostic level. Um, I think in the functional medicine model, it's how you got there, not what you call it. That's the most important feature. And, and that relates not just to testing to find the answer, but to find the process, to find the journey and to engage in the, uh, the story that really is that unique patient story that helps you understand how to unravel the story to get to the true answer of how they got there. So I hope I didn't just confuse the issue, but I'm, I, I really will turn it over now to the experts who really can better answer your question specific to mold-related disorders. Yeah, Dr. Conahan, why don't we go to you next? Like, what is it about, from your experience of functional medicine, I know this is a very like personal journey for you on how you ended up you know, treating a lot of this type of care and treating a lot of these types of patients. But what is it about the functional medicine toolkit and the way of thinking that um, you know makes it a good fit for the kinds of symptoms that come from an underlying pathology of, of environmental illness and particularly mold? Yeah, and thank you for having me, James. And thank you, Dr. Bland, for your wonderful introduction. I'm honored to be here. Um, there, it's, it's so clear as I listen, 50 or more percent of the difference in functional medicine is number one, presence and listening to the patient. I really believe the healing starts when we're present with someone who has been discounted by the com conventional community saying you're crazy, take an antidepressant or it's all in your head. Because as we well know, conventional medicine, we're not taught the innate immune system and the response to mold, we're taught it as, a, as an allergy. So we're taught about the allergic response, but we're not taught about the innate immune system response. And now, if anything has validated our finding, it's the pandemic and COVID because this is an innate immune response to a virus, right? We're seeing some of the same patterns and to all of us practicing functional medicine, this pandemic, yeah, it was a very virulent, aggressive virus, but nothing new was here as far as, yeah, new cytokines, new pathways, but we've done this before, guys, right? We were doing the same thing. And to me, it's an it's a incredible opportunity, whether it's mold, any complex chronic illness involving cytokines and innate immune system, which is... I think 80% or more of the illness that we see nowadays, it is a mystery to conventional medicine. And they're trying to often, a lot of the research I'm now seeing is like, yeah, we've known this in functional medicine for 10 or 20 years. And they're bringing out a paper, which is great because it validates what we do. But back to the first thing, number one, sitting with a patient, being present, validating their experience and listening carefully is number one. And that's where healing starts. Number two is when I say, you know what? I think I know what's going on. Literally, most of the time I have tears. Sometimes I have jaw drops and I'm sure you feel the same, Dr. Jill. When I say confidently, I know we can find answers. I know what's going on. And I may not know all the nuances, but I know the general vicinity of innate immune dysfunction or chronic complex illness. I know what to do, right? And the beautiful thing about the functional model is it could be a brand new rare disease in the realm of innate immune system dysfunction or autoimmunity. I still know what to do because I know how the body works. I know where to go with this. And it could be something I've never heard of before. We're in conventional medicine. We have no clue because we don't know there's no drug that's been um, you know, uh, developed for that condition. But I still know if I know innate immune function and I know the pathways and I know um, the complex chronic inflammatory things and I know environmental toxicity, I know what to do. And that second thing, so first of all, presence and listening. Number two is hope because hope is starting is where the healing starts. I literally had a patient today who did her dissertation on functional medicine and she surveyed a group of about 500 of my patients and my former patients. She stood at the counter as I was checking out with her in tears saying, Jill, I just wrote this dissertation. You know what the core of this entire survey was? Why did you heal? What happened with this uh, type of medicine? What was different? Every person almost to a T came down to the doctor, listened. She gave me hope and there was something different. And honestly, she said, I wrote my dissertation on the fact that, yeah, functional medicine has a groundwork and a framework, but you're applying hope. And your, that hope gives the patient an opportunity to be heard and to be seen. And that on a physiological level is where the healing starts. 
Now I could go on about the functional medicine pieces, but that I believe is so critical as a foundation is that presence and hope that we bring because we have time and we listen and we, we have a, I think all of us who go into this have a sense of curiosity that's very different. It's why we went into medicine and we're listening for clues and every day, number one, I see miracles. Number two, I, I learn from my patients because I have that approach. Beautiful. Well, Dr. Chris, I wanted to ask you, you know, along the same lines, you have your book, Break the Mold. And I know that you've been actually, you know, certifying doctors as being mold literate. And I see as I go through that list, I see there's a lot of naturopathic doctors on there. You know, what is it about the naturopathic framework that sets up doctors to really be able to um, have success with this with this type of with this type of issue? Yeah, I think naturopathic doctors, functional medicine doctors, the way that we approach the body being an individual. So it goes back to what uh, Dr. Bland was saying about the journey. So everyone comes into their mold exposure, having lived a different journey. That could be genetics, that could be nutrition, that could be chronic infections, that could be previous mold exposures. So I think that view of the body as it is the biography, (laughs) creating the biology, so to speak, and mold affects everybody differently. So I, I tell my patients, that's more the rule than the exception that you have everyone having a different experience from the same exposure because of all of those varied factors. So I think it truly is just the way functional medicine, naturopathic medicine, the way that we approach the body as a journey and looking at the whole, um, their whole history. I a hundred percent agree that that's where the, the big medicine happens in both our learning about what might be going on, but also their ability to finally express what's been going on. Yeah. Well, why don't we just, let's do a little like uh, experiment here. Let's do a little popcorn. You can shout out, you know, in whatever order you want. What, what are the things that if you go into a patient, you start having a conversation, what, what are the sort of trigger either symptoms or stories that um, would alert you to be like, hang on a minute. Like, I know I've heard this before, you know, this sounds like mold. So maybe, maybe we could just pop corn off. What are, what are some, some symptoms that you, that make you think of this now that you've been in it for this long? Well, let me, let me jump in here quickly, uh, because I'm, I'm the outlier, the non-clinician in the group, but I I wanted to give umbrage to, to a world-renowned clinical immunologist, John Hunter, J.O. Hunter, uh, at Bartholomew Hospital in in London, who, um, has been looking at this mold enigma for many, many decades, actually. And he wrote a a very powerful article that appeared in The Lancet back in the uh, early 80s, uh, in which he talked about food allergy or enterometabolic disorder, which at the time were terms that probably most people who read The Lancet didn't fully appreciate. And what he was trying to say is that people that experience problems with red wine or with uh, uh, different kinds of fermented foods or uh, individuals that uh, can't stand to be in in dark, moist places uh, are individuals who are responding to the secondary byproducts, the metabolic byproducts of a unique uh, family of organisms called fungi because fungi actually have different metabolisms, different genes. So they have different metabolic processes and do bacteria uh, than do viruses. Um, And therefore they produce a class of molecules that are uniquely different, so-called biogenic amines. I'm getting pretty biochemistry here, but I'll I'll shut up in a second. So this class of molecules that they produce um, are in some instances seen as foreign molecules, other they're mimetic molecules that mimic other kind of signaling molecules that the body naturally produces. So they can produce kind of like overloads of natural signaling neurotransmitter activities and they can block normal processes and neurological function. And so they, you might be con- they might be considered in some cases neurotoxins. And so when you start thinking about this, these foods that contain these, uh, these families of organisms um, are not necessarily producing an allergic reaction, they're producing a toxicological reaction that is unique to the genes of that individual's ability to detoxify and eliminate them. So not everybody is the same in response. Some people can be in a room that's moldy and they don't seem to have any clinical symptoms. And another person may have overwhelming headaches and muscle aches and feel like they're gonna pass out in the same environment. So. I think you have to understand the critter to understand its function, to understand its impact upon the human 
and how it differentiates itself from other types of microorganisms. So that's my my little lesson from a biochemist. Well, that was the correct answer. So well done. <laughs> <laughs> Um, actually, Dr. Chris, I wanted to ask you, I was watching a video that you put up about the difference between mycotoxin symptoms and spore symptoms, and that there were sort of two combinations, and, and both of those were coming together into mold illness. Could you jump into that? Because I, I hadn't really understood that before. Yeah, so I think it's important to understand how mold can make you sick. It's with the spores, then the spores can break up into fragments, and that's kind of what the CDC defines as mold-related illness. Those are allergies, asthma, hypersensitivity, pneumonitis, things that have to do with your skin and respiratory system interacting with the spores. And that's this much of mold related on this. And then they go all the way to the other end of the spectrum and talk about infection. So aspergillosis of the lungs, but there's 80% of the mold related illness that's not accounted for by that narrow of a definition because mold also makes chemicals, normal living mold, happily living off-gassing mold makes MPA or mycophenolic acid, which is what we make cell sept with. That's how we, how we keep organs in people once we've done transplants. So you could be breathing moldy air and getting this powerful medication just by inhalation. And then there's another one called mycotoxins. And this is an intentional toxin that molds will make with the intention of harming another living thing. So, and also in a water damage building, you're going to be getting exposure to soil bacteria like actinomycetes. They make a secondary metabolite that's that's an antibiotic. We have you know, our very own ivermectin and tetracyclines, rifamycins. These are all made from this kind of bacteria. So their off-gassing is antimicrobial. So if you're in a water damage building, you have mycophenolic acid that's immunosuppressive. You have actinomycetes metabolites, which are antimicrobial. And then you have a mycotoxin that has the intention to harm another living thing. So it's just a, it's, I feel like a whole bunch of this, I, my saying is mold related illness needs a definition upgrade, because if you just go to the CDC, you're going to be missing the majority of mold related illness. And you gave me that impression there. It almost feels like it's a kind of a bell curve where both of those are very small and the middle of the bell curve is actually the biggest part. Would you say that's fair? I think we all have our, our selection bias from our patient population. So for me, that's fair, but I started from the Lyme world. So, you know, people with stealth infections and um, chronic complex illness, I think there are quite a few people who are seeing conventional medicine for what the CDC would call mold illness and getting the antihistamines and things like that and getting better. So they don't necessarily come and find a functional medicine doctor because they maybe are getting that exposure through work. And so it's temporary, whereas in a home environment, that's where things get a little more dicey. Dr. Carnahan, you wanna go a bit further into that? I'd love to just sort of understand from you what you what you believe to be the sort of um, gold standard of, of diagnostics in this space too. And I would just say, I had never taken a mold test, but I have taken one now because I came out a couple of episodes as a gout sufferer, Dr. Bland knows, because I've hobbled to his house before. Um, but yeah, I took a mold test as part of that because my functional medicine doctor was, well, you know, it could be that, let's rule it out. I was super grateful when it came back that I had zero mold. I did the Great Plains and I took the gluten thigh on and all that stuff. So what what what, what do you use in your office and, and what is the sort of range of, of diagnostics that you've used? Um, obviously, starting with the history and then going into, you know, other kind of lab testing. You got it. And I just want to thank Dr. Bland. You brought together what I learned at like 12 years old, the biogenic means. I've always had that issue, never knew what it was until recently, you know, that last decade or so. Love that you brought that research to play because it's so common to have both histamine intolerance and mold sensitivity illness and all these things play together. Um, I always say functional medicine is quite simple. It's toxic load infectious burden at the core almost all of my chronic patients have either a toxic load or infectious burden, and they're playing on one another because the toxic load in our environment is weakening our immune system. So things that shouldn't really cause illness, I would say like low virulence, Epstein-Barr and Lyme are actually very low virulence compared to Ebola virus, which can kill a person in two or three days. Um, those types of chronic viral infections and even, yes, even tick-borne infections like Lyme are quite low virulence. They hang around a while and they don't kill people quickly. But what happens is those infections, even though they're chronic and low virulence, in the face of a weakened immune system will become a really big problem. So you always have to look at these two sides of things because 
I believe there's people with chronic infections that don't need aggressive treatment if you can strengthen their immune system and get their toxic load down where they come back up and do what we're supposed to do, which is fight viruses, fight infections, fight tick-borne things, and actually keep them at bay. For example, of course, varicella is a great one because it comes back as shingles if you have a weakened immune system. So just a framework, and thank you, Dr. Krista. I love how I've heard you talk before too, and I love how you frame that because we have such a narrow frame from our training and in, in spores, and it really is so much deeper. And microbial VOCs are really at the core. Those are the mycotoxins. One other comment before I go to testing, Dr. Or Maskell, James, um, is that I think that um, that huge uh, conundrum of the mycotoxins, I believe, and this is just my clinical experience and observation and hearing about some small studies with things like EMF actually triggering mold to produce more mycotoxins. There was a small study with a router that was, um, one was shield, uh, sorry, uh, a Petri dish of mold, and they were measuring the mycotoxin production from this mold. One was shielded um, from the router, a household routine router, and the other one was not. The one that was not shielded from the household router produced 600 times the amount of mycotoxins. So I really believe as we get into the city environments, we have more threats to that microbial. I mean, the mold is made to survive, right? So it throws off toxins in a threatful situation. And I think part of the issue is not that there's that much more mold, although there could be, it's because the mold is filling the threat of our environment and producing more toxins. And I really believe that part of the toxicity we're seeing, and then we throw in in the seventies, these antifungal paints in homes as a standard. So we kill off the weak ones, just like antibiotic resistance. And all of a sudden we have these super molds and we have these incredibly toxic things like stack Brotteries, which I think are way more toxic than your grandmother's mildew in the shower. So testing, <laughs> I'll go into that. Gosh, there's so many ways to do this. And I really like to start with things that are cheap and easy for patients, which is a great clinical history. What I was going to say earlier, James, about your question about um, what, where do we go with this is environment matters. It's the number one thing with mold. So the questions you want to ask are, when did you last feel well? And when you moved or changed environments, did you feel differently? And do you feel better when you leave the house or go on vacation? Because some of those really basic questions make such a difference because you can identify this is an environmental source, not an internal Internal source. And toxins can be both exotoxin external, like mold and metals and all these chemicals that are in our environment, or internal, like endotoxins or uh, toxins from byproducts of yeast or fungi. And we have to determine with our clinical history, is this endo or exo? Testing, I do use urinary mycotoxins. I know there's lots of controversial around that, but I feel like they are a great way to um, kind of corroborate with the clinical history. I still use visual contrast testing. Again, it's not diagnostic, but it's a great screening tool that's free. So I like free for the patients. So great history and um, the screening visual contrast tests are two ways to start. And then I also use a lot of innate system cytokines and immune testing, because although um, each one by themselves doesn't diagnose mold, MMP9, TGF beta, MSH, and now all these new cytokines, I mean, I do lots of cytokine panels, IL-4, IL-5, IL-6, TNF-alpha, et cetera. I'm testing these in my patients because I know based on those, if they're more prone to mast cell activation, if they're more prone to mold related illness. And so I look at all of those things in conjunction and there's, there's more things you can do too, but uh, those are a great place to start. I'd love to hear Dr. Krista too, if you have any other testing that you like um, for me. Yeah. The only one I will add is the, the My Myco Lab um, serum mycotoxin antibody. Right now, that is the only one other than the VCS that can kind of tell us if the person is currently being exposed. Uh, so if their IgE is positive, then we know they've been exposed to a degree that that matters to their immune system because everybody's exposed in some small way. So they've been exposed to a degree that is enough to alert their immune system and get them to make antibodies to it in the past two to four weeks. I say two weeks to my patients, but Dr. Campbell says we can count on four weeks because toxins are different than infections. But my comfort level is two weeks because my patients are trying to figure out, am I still exposed? You know, as did my remediation work is my rescue apartment um, a, a healthy apartment for me. And so I like to use that one in that case. And also with the VCS, because that does, if they're both looking bad, then I can have some assurance that they need to find, tell their insurance company, they need a new place to stay for their rescue. Yeah, that's really fascinating. You know, something you said, Dr. Conan really stuck with me. And I want to ask you, Dr. Bland about it. I don't know if you remember, but that the webinar that we did right at the beginning of the pandemic with Dr. Ari Vodstani for PLMI, and he had on one of his slides, he had sort of like a list of six factors. And it was like, depending on your six factors, you'll either get a bad case of, 
of COVID or you'll get, you know, you know, you might not even know you had it. And I remember the second one down was the exposome. And so, you know, what you were saying there, Jill, just sort of like this interconnection between um, toxic load and uh, what do you say, infectious burden. Right. Dr. Bland, where do you see the most sort of um, from your perspective and that the science of that conversation and sort of this interrelationship of, um, I guess, uh, external toxins in the environment and, and how do they play off each other in creating chronic symptoms? Well, I think, uh, first of all, that anyone who's listening, watching this is being really gifted with two of the most forward looking and thinking people in our field in this area. This, uh, you know, often goes um, without a reference point. A person doesn't know how privileged they are to be, <laughs> be getting this information from two people who have spent so much time really digging into this field and, and uh, really ferreting out answers and, and understandings that were not present before. So I, I want to acknowledge the uniqueness of that. Um, and I, the secondly, I want to say that in the context of environmental illness and how that interfaces with chron complex chronic symptoms that patients present with, this is a very, very enigmatic area in medicine. And I think the reason it's enigmatic is because we have not had discrete diagnostic criteria like you would uh, look under a microscope or you would you know, take a scan and you would say, oh yes, definitively without question, that person has blank. When a person is uh, acutely toxic, and we call it poisoned, uh, you can do an after the fact histopathology and you can look at their liver and liver cells and you can see how those cells were damaged like if they had uh, toxic mushroom ingestion. But in the chronic state, it's really hard to understand exactly how to piece together the complex symptom profile with a person's environment, which is so complex to begin with. And it differs because they might say, well, gee, I'm living in the same apartment as my partner and my partner doesn't appear to be having any problem. So why am I having a problem? So it's this complex gene environment, physiological interconnection. And that's, that's the, uh, both the mystery and the excitement about functional medicine because the functional medicine model is not deterred by that complexity. It doesn't just try to produce a simple answer to a complicated situation. It tries to find an answer to the complexity because out of the complexity becomes a simplexity, right? And it's that simplexity that is the, the driving force for the functional medicine model. It, 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 what is the reward for the countless uh, hundreds of hours that these clinicians spend to go back and open their textbooks again and look, look at all the stuff they learned earlier from a different lens and come up with a new way of evaluating patient um, presentations. So I think that this concept of exposome, the concept that we have these receptor sites on our cells that pick up information from the outside world and translate them into inside function, how that relates to things that are called pathogen associated molecular patterns or uh, uh, damage associated molecular patterns and how that translates to health and disease uh, outcomes is a new frontier of medicine. It's, this is like uh, a decade old. So we are early adopters and you're, you're, you're seeing pioneers in when you're listening uh, to the Dr. Jill's here, Jill's to the fourth power. So uh, it's, it's really a privilege to, to hear their, their perspective. Thanks, Doctor. Yeah, Dr. Crystal, you, just to, I guess, finish up from your other point, like, so now you've diagnosed someone and you actually have to work out, okay, how are we gonna fix this? And if it's in their environment, like it's in their home, you know, then um, there's some next steps. So maybe, um, you know, um, Dr. Christy, you can share sort of like what your playbook is and do you have like handouts and sheets that you give to patients to say like, hey, this is gonna be a, like a serious disruption in your life for a minute and you're gonna have to take it seriously because I think part of the overwhelm for patients is just kind of like, this isn't something you can supplement away, right? This is something that your home is poisoning you slowly and the implications of that and what needs to happen to resolve that can be quite like shocking. Yes, and there are, there are two factors working against the acceptance of the information. There's that first relief, like Dr. Carnahan was saying, when they, they feel like, oh my gosh, there's an answer. And then when they learn what the answer is, this wall goes up that, you know, in all of the environmental medicine patients that I work with, mold sick patients are the most resistant to mold being the problem. And I'm talking compared to someone who has 
lead, tungsten, cadmium, heavy metal toxicity, they can be very hard to move, but the mold sick patients are, they avoid the topic. And I think that the second thing that comes against us is kind of to, to riff off of what Dr. Bland was just saying is that we don't have randomized controlled trials in mold related illness that involves mycotoxins because of medical ethics. We can't purposefully expose someone to known carcinogens, to ratogens. You know, we can't do that just to figure out what works. We're doing it to animals. And that's what's nice about having a naturopathic and functional medicine background and approach is that we can look at those animal studies and kind of do our own clinical translational medicine to determine, okay, we know turmeric works, but what kind of dose works in a human? We kind of know that already because we're working on other types of toxicities. Um, so the, the complication is I don't want it to be mold because it's going to mess with my world. And my doctor says there's no randomized clinical control trials on this. So it's not a real thing. So now I don't have to really accept that this is a real thing. <laughs> so that's part of why I started scaling and, you know, putting my big girl panties on and getting out on the internet and talking about this because it was so hard to work against that, um, that barrier. And I'm just so grateful for people like Dr. Carnahan that are out there, have a YouTube channel and are talking about it. Um, Dr. Nathan has written books, you know, it's so great to have those third party people that we can say this, this isn't just me. Here's check out this expert, you know, this person is going to tell you that it's real. Um, so having those kind of resources are really important to, to help convince your patient and particularly your patient part, patient's partner who's not as sick, um, that this is a real thing, or maybe their landlord, or maybe their, their boss who has to move them out of their building. Uh, and then handouts, handouts, handouts like crazy, and then experts in buildings. That's one of my soapboxes is doctors need to know our lane. We are very good at bodies. Knowing the individual story of a building, buildings are as individual as bodies are. And so hiring experts, I really hammer on <laughs> this one with my patients because a really good mold inspector not only will find it when it's there, and that's one of the risks is that if you have someone that doesn't know what they're doing and they rule mold out, now you have later a cancer diagnosis, a dementia diagnosis, an MS diagnosis, something that takes a lot more effort to reverse or to impact. Um, that inspector also can help them get insurance coverage. They can help navigate the remediation. So I 100% recommend that everybody in this situation get some sort of building consultation expertise in addition to the treatment that I'm going to be working with them on. And then just, you know, handouts like crazy, nasal options for mold, diet handouts, you know, all of the things. I'm glad you mentioned that actually. And it's, it's one of the areas I think that uh, we've had success in the, the functional forum communities is that, you know, if, you, if I'm a mold inspector, I want to know every functional medicine doctor in town because chances are I'm going to get a lot of business from that. And the mold remediation is no joke. And I, I also have friends who have like, you know, tried to do a DIY remediation it hasn't worked out so well. So I, I definitely agree with you, although that can be daunting, especially if you live in a sort of a, a damp, damp part of the, of the country. Dr. Carnahan, you were referred to as a pioneer. I guess the pioneers often take some extra arrows. So what's it been like uh, being on the front of this and um, have, have arrows come your way uh, as you've been out um, speaking about this in the YouTube channel and all the, all the content that you make? Well, I have seen a huge shift and I'm sure you've seen this too, Dr. Jill. I feel like there is such a um, like 20 years ago, oh, I remember I was in a conventional medical system, integrative director and the rheumatologist and the gastroenterologist that were treating these conditions, they would be like, oh my gosh, you know, what kind of quack is this over here, Dr. Jill? But what would happen over time is their patients would go back and they were better and they would be like, well, what did you do? Well, I saw Dr. Jill, what did, she, what did she do? Can you tell me? And then little by little, and I never, I never like, I spoke to the choir who wanted to hear it, but I never went there and tried to push my agenda. What I wanted to do was show results. So I've always been someone who, and the other thing I love, and I know like Dr. Bland, I feel like you have led our community in this way is I am conventionally trained and I am so proud of that because it's a system that has been great for, you know, you have a car accident or a stroke or a heart attack and you want a conventional doctor. And that system is still the primary reimbursement system and everything in our world. So what I've tried to do in my 20 years of doing this is how do we bridge 
instead of create diversity. And again, I think Dr. Christy, you do those, such a great job, especially in your world. And we've talked about that before. I, I love learning from my naturopathic friends because so often you guys bring new ideas and things that we weren't trained. So it's like bringing these two things together with great science and great um, results. And so way back 20 years ago, what I would do is show the results. The patient would go back to their primary or their original doctor or their specialist, and the results would uh, tell for themselves the story. So that's how it started. And now I feel like things are shifting to where there is like, again, the today show just shows there's an interest now because we've just gotten out of a pandemic where there wasn't great answers and people are curious and they're wanting to know what they can do. And they're starting to take ownership and the level, the playing field has been leveled 50 years ago. Physicians were held up on a pedestal. They're no longer, and that's fine, but it's very different patients coming in today because they question us. They question, they bring their own research. Like I said, I learned so much from patients bringing in protocols or their own research and I'm open as long as it's scientifically valid and makes sense and safe. Um, and so there's this level playing field. And there's also people who are considered experts that are online with no degree at all. So, it, you know, it goes both ways. Um, I won't go into that, but I think the, the good news of this all is that patients are looking for answers themselves and they're not requiring um, just a paternalistic physician to give them a protocol and follow it blindly anymore. And that's good for us because we can come alongside the, this interest. So the original question was, I think as things move forward, we're getting less flack and we're getting more curiosity from the general public and from our colleagues. And I'll tell you one last story here. 20 years ago, I'm in med school and I was the crazy one. I had an integrated medical club, first of its kind at Loyola Medical School. They thought I was insane. I was bringing a massage therapist and naturopaths and chiropractors because I wanted my colleagues to learn there was other options. And here we are conventionally trained. Nothing like that had ever happened. They thought I was crazy. Well, now five, 10, 20 years later, I get calls all the time from people I went to medical school with kind of timidly saying, uh, Jill, um, my husband has MS or my son has seizures. Um, is there anything you could help him with? Do you have any ideas? And the tide is turned because they see any conventional doc that is trained that way when they get an interest in something bigger or greater or more in depth is usually when something happens to themselves or someone they love and they don't have the answers. And we've all been there, but that's what gives our platform um, more ability to bring this because there are a lot of places where conventional medicine doesn't have great answers and that's where we can shine. Yeah, absolutely. Dr. Krista, are there any like analogies or tools or resources that you use to sort of get the patient's head in the game as to like what's ahead of them for a full reversal of this issue? Because it's not a simple, it's not, you know, it's the difference between, you know, an acute Lyme infection and dealing with chronic Lyme. You know, these are very different animals. And I think getting the, the patient set for the task ahead, have you found ways to, to engage them so that they're, you know, inspired and excited, but also, you know, ready to fully participate in their health for the next, you know, for, for forever, but particularly for the next, let's say, three, six, nine, 12 months. Yes. And yet it's, it's interesting you said forever, because a lot of times this is the gift in this is that people start to pay attention to their health. And it may actually be the thing that prevents something even more serious down the road, because they're now engaged. Um, I love systems. I'm a very analytical person. <laughs> so when I sat down to write my book, I thought, how do I treat mold? And it came out to the, an orange. And the idea being that the, an orange, you've got to peel the outer orange layer and then that white fluffy layer before you can get into the sections. And so the idea is that there are kind of five steps I take someone through. And the first would be avoidance because as Dr. Bland said, you know, you can't get better if you're not, and you're, if you're not out of mold. Um, and so that needs to be done as close to hundred percent as possible. Just like you would peel an orange, you would peel all of the outer orange icky part, um, before you would think about eating it. The white fluffy part is fundamentals. And then the sections inside is protect, repair, and fight. So that's kind of my steps that I take using individualized medicine within each of those steps because everybody's avoidance is going to look different. Some people have to go on a very strict therapeutic diet for a while, and some people can do fine just getting out of the mold. We see in, in occupational studies that 50% of people that leave that moldy building do just fine. So I always make sure to tell people that. That's part of that hope thing Dr. Carnahan was saying. 50% of the people are fine. So look at your body's potential here. So when we do avoidance and fundamentals fully, then we pick and choose the few tools that are protective, like quercetin, resveratrol, good fish oils. 
And then we pick things that are reparative, like glutathione and things that will help repair the liver, like milk thistle. And then we go into the fight. The reason I have fight at the very end is that I did it wrong. In the beginning, I used to, when I was finally working with these Lyme patients and like, oh, this is mold. I didn't understand mold. And as I got into the research, I realized mold colonizes you. Okay, so now we need to use antifungal herbs. I went right into the antifungals and in some cases using pharmaceuticals because I was with Lyme patients who are on a lot of antibiotics. And I made people really, really sick. And it turns out that mold gets mean. Once it knows you're coming for it, it will start to kick up its production of mycotoxins. So we have to prepare the body to be ready for that extra toxic load. And I, I send patients to Dr. Carnahan's website all the time for coffee enema supplies, you know, things like that, that detoxification is so important because it sets the stage. So when you do get to that fight phase, you have some immune modulation going on, some detoxification, some bioflavonoids protecting cells, and then they can conquer the mold. That's kind of my yeah. steps. <laughs> Dr. Conahan, how do you have you found ways to, you know, to to share, you know, I'm sure with your functional medicine strategy, there's some similarities there, right? But like, how do you get the patients in the game to realize like we can't go after the mold yet? We're going there, but this is what we have to do first. How do you how do you facilitate that sort of like delayed gratification in patients? Mm -hmm. Well, sometimes I just say my story because I was delayed six months before I would admit it. So I know at a personal level that denial. And second thing that I know Dr. Chris and I both agree and have talked about before in some of our interviews is this limbic system piece that I don't want to miss addressing because it's so profound. And really, you can almost not get to the layer of the physiology until you address the limbic system. I don't know why, but mold is a massive threat to the limbic system. So I don't know the physiology behind how it affects the brain, but I know 100% of my patients that are affected by mold have some sort of trauma response. And it's that limbic activation. I believe it's a physiological, a real, like a measurable response. I don't think it's just something that's in their head. And this limbic response causes amygdala activation and uh, the fear and threat. And so as they're dealing with this, number one, their brain is not functioning at all because when you get the limbic system activated, frontal cortex shuts off and that's your decision maker. That's your executive function. That's your ability to prioritize a protocol or a plan. So I even remember back in the day when I had mold illness, I thought I was functioning fine. And I look back and I'm like, it is a wonder I didn't do something dangerous because I was not functioning um, well in that time. And uh, what I realize now is that limbic activation blocks frontal cortex. So the, even the understanding of what the diagnosis is, and then also when they get another exposure, um, dealing with it, dealing with it, there's a lot of the blocks are, are part of that limbic response. So the number one thing we have to do is give them some limbic solutions. These could include, you guys are probably real familiar with things like Annie Hopper's DNRS, Gupta program. Um, Beth O'Hara has a new program. Um, I'd love to, Dr. Christy, if you have others and cranial sacral, um, as sometimes neuro-linguistic programming, trauma work, somatic work, EMDR. There's so many things, even um, biurnal beats or sounds. Stephen Porges has a program and I could list 20 things and I give them a handout with links to those resources so they can get some of those on board. I say, it's like a smorgasbord or a buffet. You do not have to do all of these. And when they're in that shock of fight or flight, sometimes some of the programs like DNRS is real um, familiar with a lot of people, but it's a, it's a commitment to an hour a day. And that might be too much for them. So I say, go get a massage, go get cranial sacral therapy, let something passively start to help your limbic system calm down because number one thing is safety and mold is a threat on every level to a patient's safety. It's their home, it's their brain, it's their body. And I really believe part of the complexity and toxicity of mold is that it's a threat to the very safety of the core person being. So addressing that limbic response is kind of how you can get past that to get to a treatment because often these people will be like reactive to water. I mean, some of them can be so reactive. You can't even start a protocol. And um, that would be one thing I think. And then second layer mast cell activation, which if you talk to some of the experts, Dr. Theo Theoridis, Dr. Lawrence Afrin, who've written extensively and published they will tell you the number one uh, trigger for mast cell activation is mold and they're in a conventional research setting. So those are two things that I think are important as well. Yeah, there's so many um, interesting, thanks for sharing all of that. It's incredible uh, to, to get that sort of download because um, I know that that's part of the complexity is, is dealing with how it, you know, it affects all the, all the different systems. You know, Dr. Bland, it seems like, it seems like, uh, you know, um, the few, you know that as long as as long as mold is around, 
functional medicine is 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 going to be practiced because it doesn't seem like there's you know there's much hope unless you're taking a, a root cause systems biology approach given the complexity and all the the layers of, of depth that are, that's been described here yeah you know there is as i'm listening to these incredible experts um i'm reflecting back to my last uh, 40 years in the field and I, i'm reminded of uh, a meeting that I went to and I was invited to uh, at the NIMH, the National Institutes of, of Mental Health and, and Environmental Medicine at, um, in Bethesda. This would have been back in the, um, probably the late seventies, I guess. And this was a time where they, the government had just built uh, a brand new building for the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency. And people in that building were getting very sick. And the construct was that they were having psychological dysfunction, that there was something wrong with the you know, way that they were being managed or stress and they, they were somehow they were having these uh, what were considered functional illnesses. And back in those days, functional somatic symptom was another name for psychosomatic illness. So they were having functional somatic symptoms which was being said as a consequence of it's all in your mind disease. And then finally, a group of individuals, maybe a little bit more enlightened and more on the frontier started saying, well, hold on, maybe there's something in this building that's actually associated with this kind of epidemic of people feeling bad. Maybe it's not just like uh, they're having social disorder because of somebody that has said they should not feel well. Maybe there's something really organic. And they started to look at it much more intensely. And of course, they found that the building was poorly constructed. There were all these sites where the ventilation system, the HVAC was not working and there was mold and they had to take the building apart. Right. And that was from, from what I know, and I may be wrong on this, but it's the first example I, I saw in the literature where they defined this as sick building syndrome. Well, that was kind of the start of the going from kind of, it's all in your mind to where, no, actually the federal government in the EPA's own billing, Environmental Protection Agency, recognize that maybe there's something to the environment that can produce these symptoms organically. So it's, it's amazing to see how far we've come, but in some ways, maybe it's also disappointing we haven't come farther, that still we have these leaders that uh, are advancing this concept and there's a lot of people still pushing back because they haven't what, had what they consider adequate proof. All they have to do is look at the body of literature over the last 40 years to kind of get the story. But that's that's kind of where I am in, in listening to this wonderful kind of uh, dis description of our two uh, clinical leaders here. We well, yeah, I'd like to just go a little step further there because I was speaking to a doctor friend the other day who's, who works with the American Association or Academy of Environmental Medicine. And, you know, they've had education on these topics uh, recently and, you know, have had quite a, a sort of a blowout with ACCME about, you know, continuing med medical education on this topic. And it does seem that, um, you know, some of the areas that this topic, you know, uh, shunts around is, is um, caustic to, you know, to those kind of, those, those kind of organizations. So, I mean, Jill, do you think that there's hope in that regard? Um, do you think it's just a case of just continuing to prove the outcomes and eventually, you know, medicine moves forward one funeral at a time, or do you think there's another way that we can sort of accelerate this evolution towards um, systems biology approaches and, and understanding the root cause? Which Jill? <laughs> yeah, I, it's, my, it's my way of keeping it open. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Oh. I would say the, the results, right? Like kind of like we said before, like as we start to see people healed and um, and I know Jill, you writing and I'm writing and I'm doing a documentary, these things, like I have such a passion just like you do for getting, and you've already just like, I've shared your book with my patients too. So I love that we can play off each other <laughs> and I have such respect for the work that you've done. So it's, I think we, we just continue to get the word out. And even though I have a love hate relationship with social media, that's a platform where people are listening. And so I'm there and I'm talking and I'm talking about this topic because the, you know, the public, that's where the ground you know, a uh, swell, the forces can actually make a change in policy and um, in the environment. 
Now, Dr. Chris, I understand you've had some success in this area now as well uh, with, with getting um, continuing medical education for, for this topic. So anything that we can learn from you? Yeah, I think just continuing to reiterate the fact that in toxin-based illness, medical ethics preclude us from doing randomized clinical control trials. I mean, that's really, that's the, that's the nugget. And so we are in, a, in the business of using animal studies, which, of which there are plenty, and there are human studies, but they're retrospective. They're, oops, everybody at the hospital got sick, or oops, everybody at the school got sick. Um, but as far as what to do to get someone better, other than the avoidance, then, you know, presenting the research that shows in occupational studies that 50% of the people do get better getting out, 50% don't, 50% have persistent symptoms that can last 10, 20 years after that exposure. So something that does need to be done treatment wise. And the more that I've been educating, I, I hear medical doctors not you guys, but conventional is saying, well, no one really wants to find this because we don't have anything to treat it. So my next challenge is to figure out how to prescription pad our way out of mold illness. And that's my, that's my current challenge is to figure that out. Well, I, yeah, I want to share something there. That 50, 50 uh, ratio thing reminds me of, you know, sort of the Cleveland Clinic Center for Functional Medicine, where you put hundred percent of people through uh, a 12 week group where they have to do the fundamentals of health and half the people get better and don't need the doctor. And then half will need to, you know, to go down a path of getting to the root cause. So I think, you know, I think one of the things that I appreciated from, from, from all of you guys here tonight is just thinking about what are the sort of the, um, you know, the, what, what we can do to get, to get everyone started. And certainly even if you go back to the video at the beginning, the foundation, the bottom of the matrix, doing the fundamentals of health, um, being connected to other people, stimulating the limbic system through, uh, you know, through connection and engagement is, is a real possibility. And we're seeing, and I would say from my own experience, you know, we're seeing that if you organize personalized lifestyle medicine or functional medicine in such a way that it becomes palatable to the systems, you know, then the uptake of that is, 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 is not as unlikely as it once was. And I think um, things are changing, things are changing rapidly. I'm not sure if mold is going to lead us into the next era, but COVID might and long COVID might. And so it's exciting to see, you know, sort of uh, new areas of interest and, um, things moving in the, in this, uh, in this direction. Well, I, I want to thank all of you for, you know, for your participation here this evening. And I know, as I shared here at the beginning, we're going to be hanging out in, uh, in Chicago. Um, this event is sold out, but if you want to get in touch with us, we're, we're hoping to con convince Dr. Bland to do some live streaming or something. We'll definitely be there with the camera. So we'll get some, some of the best bits and get some interviews with some of the, uh, the other speakers. Um, I think this world of, a functional immunity uh, is really, you know, ready for its its time to shine. Thank you so much to all the sponsors for today for the the functional forum, and you know, just to highlight a few things. I mean, it's been a big uh, month for Full Script. They acquired Emerson Ecologics, and I know, you know, they've just uh, there's so much that they can do on Full Script. Actually, there are uh, protocols. Um, where you can at least get a starting point if you don't really know where to go. There's some great resources on there on um, supplement protocols created by some of the leaders in the field on just these types of topics. Um, you know, Evexia Diagnostics, when I got all my lab tests for getting to the root cause of my condition, that was easy to put it all together. And I just want to give a shout out to the HEAL community because, you know, one of the people actually that works for me, um, he took two years out of his life to recover from Lyme and mold with the help of a functional medicine doctor, Dr. Christine Burke. And, you know, he, he said a number of times that, you know, had he been in a community of other people who were at different stages of their development and different stages of their, you know, chronic disease reversal, then, you know, the whole thing would have happened a lot quicker. And I think that, you know, those patients that come out of the other side of this, are ready to be of service, right, to the, to the whole and are ready to help. And so if you can find a way to connect those who are just looking for hope at the beginning, like you said, Dr. Callahan, who are just at the beginning, who, who have no hope, to have them meet other people who are just like them, but further along the path, um, can be one of the most powerful tools in, in healthcare that we're using to really a very, very small percent of, it, of its potential. 
All right. So next next month, second uh, of May, twenty twenty two, the hundredth episode. Uh, we're going to be live from Indianapolis. The reason why we're live from Indianapolis is because Indianapolis has such a thriving community, and it's just one of the communities um, that is thriving across the country. Uh, we would love to hear from you if you want to be part of a community wherever you are in the world. Uh, we'd love to hear from you, and maybe we can pay you up with uh, a, a local organizer. Um, thank you, Dr. Bland, Dr. Krista, and Dr. Carnahan for being uh, part of the show tonight. This has been uh, the uh, the Functional Forum. This is the 99th episode. Uh, we've all learned a lot. Thanks so much for tuning in, and we'll see you next time.